Um, did my pediatrics residency in Chicago, spent some time there. That's where I started getting interested in um, sports medicine. So I uh, worked with a bunch of folks from Northwestern, um, worked with some, um, you know, working at the uh, finish line of triathlons, marathons, and things like that. And then eventually went and did my pediatric sports medicine fellowship at Texas Children's um, down in Houston. Um, and then now I've been up here in Seaboat for nine years, never, never want to leave. Um, my daughter will be starting U10s this year, and then I've got a son who's almost three, and I guarantee you he will be in the Winter Sports Club the way this voice works. So um, as far as what I'm looking for to just kind of get across today, um, just outline these roles of the athlete, the parent, and the coach when that athlete experiences an injury, from that first 24 hours just into the next few weeks, um, also understanding what are those first initial steps to take. And I know a lot of the coaches, you guys know this, and I'm sure a lot of the parents know these things too. But just to sort of review, this is what, um, the, this is still remaining the, the best scientific evidence about what we should be doing um, from the get-go. Um, discuss the roles of the physician and physical therapist, because certainly I get these questions from parents too about, you know, do I need to see the physician? Do I need to go to the ER? Do I need to, you know, what, what, who should we be getting involved in caring for this injury? And as John alluded to, you know, as far as that team approach, I think is, is pretty huge. And I think really the more people we get involved with helping to um, handle different aspects of that return to play can be really beneficial. Um, and then also understanding a return to play following a concussion is different from musculoskeletal injury. It's actually starting to become very, very different. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, when it comes to concussion, you um, really have to be 100% as sure as you can be um, that that kid is fully ready to go. Um, and we'll talk about why that's important. As opposed to musculoskeletal injury, where most of the time you can be 90%, you can be 80%, and you probably can get someone back into um, you know, training more and, and competition more, whereas with concussion it just doesn't work that way. And just reminding that everybody's goal is, is having this kid safe return to play. So uh, you know, nobody wants to put a kid back out there um, when you have that really high risk of re-injuring, and certainly you don't want to do it when you are recovering from a concussion, and you're going to have a risk of sudden death. So safe return to play is, at the end of the day, um, everyone's goal. So to break down again, so I'm going to kind of split this talk a little bit in terms of musculoskeletal injuries and then in terms of concussion. So to start going into the musculoskeletal stuff, oh wait, con communication stuff. So again, athlete, parents, coach, teachers, physical therapist, physician, and now when it comes to concussions, we're really involving the school nurses more. Um, and with all of these moving parts and with all of these people involved, um, sometimes it's really good to have you know, that point person. So whether that's the parent, whether that's the athlete, I really encourage parents to try to have that athlete be that point person. Um, sometimes you know, if you have a younger kid who's 11 or 12, obviously that's not gonna work. But if you've got a 16, 17, 18 year old, having them really take control of getting themselves healthier and getting themselves better with some guidance from these people around them is pretty important. Um, the school nurse actually, um, we're at this point now where it, from the um, concussion recovery standpoint, um, all of the concussion providers um, and you know ancillary providers, as therapists, school nurses, we're all actually trying to meet in town on a every three to four month basis to kind of make sure that we are doing everything we can to um, best treat these kids with concussions in town. Um, and by default, we've had these uh, forms that show up in terms of getting a kid into um, you know, back into school and, and having certain forms be that the school nurse is, is really managing. So just knowing that um, there is starting to be a, an increased role for that school nurse when it comes to concussion management. To a lesser degree, musculoskeletal injuries, sure, but um, concussion is really where we're seeing that. When we start talking about the injured athlete, and I see this happen just every year. I see it happen again and again. So anytime you've got a teenager especially, you pull away part of their identity when they get injured. You know, I, I think of myself as a ski racer, you pull that away, all right, now what? You know, school, I'm okay at school. You know, I don't, you, know, you really start to have to pull, when you start pulling away those pieces of their identity, um, that's gonna make it harder and harder for them to handle in a healthy way that return to play. They're pulling, you're pulling them away from their friends. Um, you know, if most of their social interaction is coming from Winter Sports Club and all of a sudden they aren't at Winter Sports Club anymore, that can be a really big problem when it comes to their mental health especially. You're also dealing with that pain and that frustration, and obviously a lot of teenagers don't know how to deal with that, those things. Adults don't know how to deal with those things in a healthy way. So again, whether that's the coach or whether that's the parent, um, or whether it's even the physician getting involved to help guide that management of that pain and figure a good healthy outlet for that frustration. Fear is a big part of this. 
Um, you know, you guys got that athlete who's worried, you know, they know when, um, not a lot of them know that, they get a concussion, they're usually gonna be out for a few weeks, you know, am I gonna get out of shape? Am I gonna get behind on my training? So that's where, too, the coaches can be really involved with saying, all right, this is what we're doing, so when we get you back in, we're gonna start working on these things. That can help a lot. All of that can end up resulting in um, a kid who's starting to have issues with depression, and then if you get that kind of downward spiral happening, you're gonna start having a kid making a lot of poor choices. You get a kid who's starting to be around, um, you know, going to these parties, getting poor choices with drugs, with alcohol, all of that stuff can really compound these problems. And so really paying attention to your athlete, paying attention to your child, and really understanding that, all right, if you're starting to see any of these warning signs, getting involved, starting to try to do something to help um, stave off some of these things to happen. That, that can end up happening. Um, and I also like to focus on, when you have an injured athlete, you know, really focus on that athlete and, and having that athlete really keep asking that question about what can I do? You know, there's a lot of things that they really focus on, I can't, maybe I can't go skiing, I can't do dry land, I can't do this. Well, a lot of times there are things they can do. There are things that they, you know, can really still help with that training process, and that's what you really need to focus on for them. So musculoskeletal stuff. Um, my child is injured, now what? And this goes for the coaches as well as parents. Um, so ED, emergency department. Um, yes, so you definitely want to be taking a kid to the emergency department if x-rays are needed sooner, sooner than later. Um, certainly, uh, you can wait 24 hours, get x-rays in the outpatient MD office. I see it happen all the time. Um, I see parents feel really guilty when the kid ends up having something broken and they didn't take him to the, to the ER, and that's, it's fine. I mean, you sought appropriate medical care in an appropriate amount of time. So I, I don't have a problem with that, but certainly if you feel something's broken, and you need x-rays done, the emergency department is where you need to be going. Um, you need to be going to the emergency department if necrotic pain meds are needed. Um, it's really not um, a kosher thing to be calling up the doc and saying, you know, my kid's in a ton of pain, um, can we come see you tomorrow, but will you call in some, you know, oxycodone for me? It just doesn't really work that way, and I've gotten those phone calls, and so just making sure people understand that, all right, if, if you've got a kid who's in that much pain, that ibuprofen and Tylenol aren't cutting it, that's a reason to be going into the emergency department. Um, obviously, if, if you've got a, a, an obviously broken bone, certainly you need reduction of it. Reduction meaning you need to basically put it all back into place. A lot of times that can be done in the emergency department. They just kind of put kids into what's called conscious sedation, give them some medicines, put things back into place. Um, and then splinting for comfort. I mean, there's nothing wrong with going to the emergency department. I think it's broken. It's not broken, but um, now we know for sure. And then you can splint that. You can get um, a fiberglass splint. You can get making sure that that kid is, is comfortable um, to be able to sleep, to be able to go to school the next day. Um, emergency department now versus MD office in the AM. And so this is where I really encourage people have them call their primary care provider. So primary care provider. So they're you know main your family doctor, your pediatrician, the PA you always see, the nurse practitioner you always see. Um, that's what those after hours phone calls are for. I never get upset when a parent calls me and says, do I need to take this to the ER? Can this wait till tomorrow? That's an absolutely reasonable phone call to take. Um, and so certainly if, uh, as a coach, you don't know if the kid should be going to the ER or not, encourage the, the, the parents to call their, um, their on-call provider. Um, certainly they may not be able to talk to their actual providers, you know, someone could be someone covering for them, but those questions um, are, are a reasonable question to be asked. Um, keeping in mind too, answers aren't always clear cut. You know, I take phone calls over the phone and sometimes you're just not sure if it should wait till tomorrow if it can go to the ER uh, or if it should go to the ER. And if you're still not sure, if you talk to you talk it all out, it's better safe than sorry and just going to the ER is a reasonable thing to do. Um, downsides obviously is the cost is a big issue. Um, you get that you get that ER um, in the middle of winter with a lot of tourists um, on an icy day, you're gonna be having a, a longer wait. And I've actually run into this with some parents who don't understand that um, you aren't going to get an MRI in the emergency department. So emergency department is for, you know, really acute stuff, you know, getting x-rays, potentially a, C a CT scan or a CAT scan, which is actually a very quick scan. MRI, as most of you know, it takes a good hour, sometimes even a little bit longer. It needs to be scheduled. Um, sometimes, you know, in some kids, if you have a lot of kids with a lot of anxiety, you're going to need to do a little bit of sedation with it. So making sure parents understand, too, that um, you're not going to get an MRI there, that that is definitely an outpatient thing to have done. Um, first 24 hours, you guys all know this, but it still is really just the same. Um, you want that kid to be resting, whatever they ended up hurting. Um, as far as icing goes, um, 20 minutes on, 20 minutes off. 
Um, you know, there, there is a risk of uh, frostbite injury if a kid falls asleep with ice on. So just making sure that um, they are setting a little, you know, alarm on their phone, you're setting an alarm on your phone, something like that, just to make sure that they're able to get that ice off for a little bit um, to decrease that frostbite injury risk. Compression, I always tell all parents to just have ace bandages around the house. They're super handy, they're super cheap, you can buy them at the grocery store, you're going to use them. Um, and decreasing that amount of swelling can be really helpful for, um, you know, recovery in the long run. So certainly having those ace bandages and getting them on can be really helpful. Elevation, obviously, same idea, just trying to decrease that amount of swelling by, um, by keeping whatever they injured up and off of it is good. Can I just say, yeah. it's so nice to see that that model is still relevant. When Absolutely. It seems like models these days, whatever, whether it's, whatever the model is, they're just always changing and this is the same. It was so funny, I, somebody not long ago, I said, okay, 20 minutes on, 20 minutes off, do this and this, and then I thought to myself, I hope that still is good. Yep, yeah, absolutely, <laughs> yeah, for sure it is, yeah, and it, and it really does, I mean, it plays a role and, and this helps improve recovery times. Oh, my CPR always seems to be bad. So yeah, CPR all, has changed all so All models are changing. Yeah, but for sure, this, oldie but goodie, and it's still the same. Um, do I need to have my athlete seen by a physician at all? And certainly, for some things, no, you really don't. Um, and kind of follow these guidelines to determine if, if a physician needs to be um, involved. Can the athlete perform ADLs? ADL stands for Activities of Daily Living. So, you know, can they get themselves out of bed? Teenagers need help with that a lot. Anyway, but just trying to get like their life stuff that they need to do, can they do it? Um, can they get themselves to school? Can they reasonably get around school? Um, can they get to all their classes? Is the pain well controlled by OTC over-the-counter medicines? Can, you know, giving ibuprofen, giving Tylenol, is that okay and is that helping them? If it is, great. Um, this is a big one, is a kid limping? Um, we don't, you know, I'm okay with a limp for 24, 48 hours, but if you've got a kid who's been limping for a week, that's a problem because now you're gonna start having so many musculoskeletal um, biomechanical imbalances, you're going to start having all kinds of other injuries that are piling on top of the initial injury. So, you know, if, if you've got these things there where this kid is really, they're able to do all their regular stuff, I just tweaked my ankle, they don't have much of a limb, they're not even really taking ibuprofen, you're doing compression, you're icing it, absolutely, go work with this Winter Sports Club PTs um, because they're a huge, huge resource to be able to just do some of this, this stuff um, at home. And then, obviously, the physical therapist can give a little guidance, too. You know, if the injury really isn't progressing over the next week or two, yeah, it's probably time to go see the physician. Um, is, are they, you know, is, are there certain exercises that that kid can be doing just to help get them back a little bit sooner? So, um, this is another role of, of the physical therapist. We're not necessarily going to the physical therapy office, but Winter Sports Club can be helping with, um, with those return to play things. Role of the physician, so I can help confirm that diagnosis. So, you know, if you have had a longer recovery, then it should be happening, all right. Well, has anyone got an x-ray? It's time to get x-rays. Uh, is it um, this, an issue where, well, you know, we thought it was this, and, you know, we're doing physical therapy with our sports club, but, you know, now we're wondering if, you know, B and C are going on. Well, that's where certainly um, I can play a role with help confirming that, which also helps give a little bit of a timeline um, for return to play, because if you get a little more of a, a true diagnosis going on, that can help. And sometimes you have two things going on, you know, it looks like it's just this, and there's also something else going on. I can also help order formal physical therapy. Um, that physical therapy, you know, outside of what's kind of done with the club, um, does require a physician um, referral. And um, that is something where we do need to see, uh, see a patient to be able to give that. Um, I also get this question quite a bit. So PCP stands for primary care provider. When can I see, when should I see my primary care provider or when should I just go see the orthopedic surgeon? And I have no problems with parents just going straight to see the orthopedic surgeon. It's absolutely fine. I think they, we have great orthopedists in town. Um, but definitely make sure parents understand to check with their insurance first. I've had parents be burned because they went to go see the orthopedics, uh, the orthopedic surgeon first, and yep, everything was fine. They didn't need surgery, that's fine. And then they get hit with this big um, bill and everything's out of network because they were supposed to see their primary care provider first. So there are still some um, healthcare models where you need to see that um, primary care provider first to provide that orthopedic referral. Um, we are not able to give those retroactively because it goes against the whole idea of 
see your primary care provider to see if you need to see the orthopedic surgeon. So, um, so certainly if a parent does want to go see the orthopedic surgeon, they call our office, they call me about it. I tell them absolutely feel free to go see orthopedics, but definitely check your insurance first. Cost is usually higher with the orthopedic surgeon versus the uh, primary care provider. Sometimes there's the availability issue. You know, you really want to see the shoulder guy, but you can't really see him until, you know, a week or two out. Um, in some cases, it helps to see the primary care provider first to get that physical therapy ball rolling and then potentially see the orthopedist. Um, and then anytime that there's a concern about, you know, do I think my kid's going to need surgery? Absolutely go see the orthopedist. Are you going to need injections? Are you going to need casting? Um, because of how, I, I actually used to do casting in, in, when I first came to Steamboat, but um, it seems like just most of it is getting referred to and moved to orthopedics anyway that I actually stopped doing it just because I wasn't doing it enough. So we're at this point now where um, surgery, injections, or casting, anything with that should be seeing an orthopedist um, first. So. Role of physical therapist. So all right, you get a kid who comes to me, we get the diagnosis, we get the physical therapist involved. And now I'm talking more about that physical therapist who is um, working in their office. Um, these guys are, I, I just love the therapists in town because they really do such a great job with keeping a really close eye on these athletes. Because when you start, you know, sometimes that, you know, that coach is just down to maybe a texting rule, are you doing, how are you doing, what are you up to? You know, the, um, the physician has kind of played their role in terms of doing referrals, getting imaging studies, that sort of thing. So now it's really that physical therapist who can follow that kid very, very closely and monitor their progression. And so typically they're, they're seeing them one to three times a week just to monitor that improvement, helping with those exercises, giving the, that home exercise program to help with recovery. I can't stress how important that home exercise program is and compliance with that is. The compliance issue with that in, in teenagers is always a huge, huge deal, but it's just always kind of trying to make, you know, get cut through that when they're having that pain and that frustration that this is what you can focus on to help get you better faster. And then the physical therapist also can really help determine that return to play readiness or at least say, all right, now's the time when you should go back and talk to the doctor about talking with clearance. Because a lot of times the physical therapist don't feel comfortable giving that full clearance, especially when we come to concussion stuff. But, um, but sometimes they, they are really comfortable saying, all right, I think you're good to go. And I rely on them to help me with that stuff, the, those decisions as well. So role of the parent. Um, I think a lot of this is, is, is common sense, but you know, for, cer for certain, there, there are just sometimes that it's hard in parenting to know how much do you push and how much do you not. So the guidance side of things um, is really a matter of, all right, well, do we need, you know, helping that kid determine, do we need to see the doctor, do we need to not see the doctor? Giving that moral support and giving that gentle push without nagging, because I think a lot of kids do need a little bit of that push now and then. Um, but I think a lot of that, a lot of that big thing is uh, really looking for monitoring for that signs of depression, because that can play such a huge role. That mental side of things and, and injury recovery plays such a huge role. And parents are, are the ones who know their kids best. They know if there's some of um, these red flags that are starting to show. I think it's really important, and I know coaches are busy, everybody's busy, but, but still trying to stay in contact with that injured athlete. Um, even just texting, totally fine, but just uh, keeping them up to date. Um, some kids, for sure, are not going to want to hear about all that sort of stuff, and you have to kind of play it, you know, sort that out a little bit. But I think um, just making sure that, you know, that athlete knows that someone really is, you know, team misses you, we look forward to getting you back giving that moral, that moral support. And then also, once the physical therapists are starting to just kind of, you know, open things up a little bit, to sort of tailor those workouts just to be able to still get that kid involved. Um, this is where that communication comes back into play of getting the coach and the physical therapist and the um, physician all on the same page with everything. Um, I am happy to talk with coaches and, and Blair's got my phone number and he, yeah, give me a call, I'm happy to always, um, talk with people about return to play decisions as well. Back to the whole role of the athlete, it's really important if you can to have them take control of their injury. Back to the whole idea of what can I do? All right, I can't do this, and you know, I can't do anything lower body, but all right, I can do all kinds of upper body work. All right, that's what I'm gonna focus on for right now. I can do all kinds of core work. That's what we're gonna focus on for right now. And then um, also encouraging that athlete, parents are there encourage the athlete to stay in contact with their coach. Um, you know, just, just kind of just checking in once a week, whatever it is, just making sure that that connection is still there um, so that they do realize that they're an important part of that team. And then as far as physical therapy exercises, there's a ton of research that's actually now showing that when it comes to teenagers, if you want them to do anything um, on an independent basis, have them have set reminders on their phone. 
Um, when it comes to taking diabetes medicines or asthma medicines or whatever, physical therapy exercises, if they can have little reminders on their phone of, all right, this is what I need to do this, did I check this off for today, has actually been shown to really help a lot with compliance in teenagers. All right, I'm gonna switch gears and we're gonna head more into the concussion side of things. Um, and I just wanna put a picture of this guy. So Jake Snakenberg, um, he was a uh, junior varsity football player on the front range. And in 2004, he was playing football, sustained a, um, a concussion, didn't tell anybody. Coaches didn't pick it up. His friends knew something was going was wrong because he wasn't himself at school, but he still going to school. He had his headaches. He was kind of just out of it. Um, felt like he was, he felt he was okay, good to go. Went back into a JV varsity football game, took a hard hit, had massive brain swelling on the spot, and ended up dying of second impact syndrome. And so the Colorado concussion legislation is named after him um, because his parents, along with a bunch of other folks down in Denver, really took a strong role saying, all right, we don't want this to happen to anyone else. And this is why we're so adamant about concussion return to play and making sure that everybody feels comfortable that if a kid takes another hit, that um, they are not gonna have that second impact syndrome. So um, I also like to say too, that as far as concussion legislation goes, um, in the last couple of years, it is now in every single state. There is concussion legislation in terms of return to play. It varies a little bit in terms of who can give that clearance, it varies a little bit in terms of the education component, but every single state now has concussion legislation in place. So, uh, Jake Snickenberg Youth Concussion Act of 2012. So this applies to middle school, high school, and athletes in private clubs, 11 to 19 years of age. So yes, it does apply to winter sports club. Um, obviously, it doesn't necessarily apply to those you tend, but I think it's really important to be still putting everything across, um, you know, all the age groups so that everybody understands this is something you take really seriously. Coaches must take an annual course. Um, coaches must pull an athlete from play if concussion is suspected. I'm trying really hard to make sure parents understand this. That is, you know, the coach has to pull that kid out if a concussion is suspected, period. It's state law. Um, to really take that onus off of, you're pulling that kid out, whatever, it's a safety issue in terms of a concussion, and you always have to just back that coach up for that reason. In Colorado, um, an athlete must return to clearance from a medical professional prior to return to play. And in, in, in the Jake Snakenberg Act, it defines um, medical professional as an MD, a DO, a nurse practitioner, a physician assistant, or a neuropsychologist with concussion training, although in our area there are no neuropsychologists with concussion training um, who can do return to play. That's more down Denver area. So therefore, physical therapists cannot clear um, post-concussion. Chiropractors can't clear, naturopaths can't clear, they just can't get that legal clearance. Um, as far as concussion goes, so this is the official definition of concussion based on the Zurich Conference. These are, um, Zurich Conferences have occurred, this was the fourth one, and I think they're actually doing another one here in 2016, um, where they just get the best specialists in the world as far as concussion goes. They all get them together and decide, all right, this is the definition of concussion, this is what we recommend that, um, as far as return to play guidelines. Um, this is what we recommend as far as what we've been seeing for a, a, as far as um, beneficial therapies. Um, so you can read that, but um, basically it's, it's a complex physiological process. So keep in mind that concussion isn't your bell ringing wrong. It isn't, um, yeah, it just took a little hit. It really is a big deal that's going on as far as brain cells being injured on that cellular level. Um, this goes into a little bit more as far as that con um, the concussion definition. And with each of these points, I think it just goes into a certain issue. So number one, you don't have to have a hit to the head to sustain a concussion. Um, you can have an impulse, like a big force to you know, get hit on the chest, get hit on the body, have enough of a um, um, you know, whiplash injury that that whiplash injury can actually cause concussion. Um, Concussion typically results in rapid inset, uh, onset of short-lived impairment of neurologic function. Um, in some cases, it can take a while for things to show up. And I think the biggest thing in this is understanding that um, concussion can sometimes take 24 to 72 hours to really decide if something's happening. Uh, if there truly is a concussion present, I guess is the best way to put it. Um, it's very, you know, it, it, that's where a lot of that same day return to play, co pull, coaches pulling any concern for a concussion happening. Um, because sometimes you can have a kid who seems totally fine, four hours later they are having a hard time with any sort of, um, you know, remembering what happened to them, they're having horrible headaches, but in that first, you know, couple hours, they seem like they're acting just fine. Um, 
Concussion can result in, or may result in neuropathological changes, but basically what that uh, third point is saying is that you can't diagnose concussion on a CT scan, you can't diagnose concussion with a um, standard MRI. Yes, there are functional MRIs or PET scans, but those are used in research purposes. They aren't used for concussion um, diagnosis. So there is no imaging study, there is no blood test as of yet that tells us, yep, yeah, there's definitely a concussion present. There's a lot of research being done to try to get something, but we're still probably 10, 15 years away from that. Um, the last point just um, drives home that you do not have to have loss of conscious, cons consciousness to have a concussion. And actually, 90% of concussions do not involve a loss of consciousness. Um, so it's more a matter of, you know, there's still some parents out there who feel like, well, my kid doesn't have a concussion because they weren't knocked out. And actually, most kids aren't knocked out when it comes to a concussion. Shannon, what do you yeah. do when you have a, a kid that you have pulled from training because they took a bad whack to the head and, and they go and get a physician's thing that night? And I find that really hard because um, what do you do when, when it's, it's, you know, you're basically dealing with a physician who maybe doesn't understand that you've got that 24 to 72 hour window for symptoms to show up. In those cases, I think everybody's done their due diligence and, and on, honestly, but based on concussion legislation, based on everything, the, the buck stops with me. That, that onus is on me. If something bad happens to that kid, that is the physician's fault for clearing that kid. So everybody's done what they can. If there really is a you know a parent who doesn't feel comfortable, then um, you know they should be holding their kid out some more. But as far as from you know a coaching standpoint, you did what you're supposed to do. So yeah, it's they're still we're we're doing our best to still you know from the medical community side of things have frequent concussion um, lectures, continuing medical education, getting specialists up here um, every about one to two years doing some concussion stuff. But there are definitely some of the myths that are still around. My advice, because yeah. it's happened to us, as a coach, you tell the parents to get a second opinion. Right. And I think that's fair, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So that's, that's, what happened. that's what our coach did, because they cleared out the emergency room, and the coach said, no, you're not right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, especially, yeah, especially there you have that gut feeling that you're not right. Yeah. Concussion mechanisms, so a lot of concussions are actually rotational injuries. They don't necessarily have to be, though. Um, and this is why you can actually see concussions where um, you don't have a hit to the head, but you still have brain injury. It's called a coup contra coup injury, where basically you have a movement going forward, the brain hits the uh, front side of the skull, and then pushes backwards, hits um, damage to the back part of the skull as well, uh, or the back part of the brain as well, um, from hitting the back part of the skull. And so that is um, how you can get actually diffuse issues with all kinds of different um, symptoms with concussion is because you actually really can have different parts of the brain that are affected. So the Kukachu injury, the whiplash. Um, also keep in mind in teenagers, so there's a very different, um, what I'm finding too is that adults dealing with concussion, or teenagers dealing with concussion, it's a, it's a very different world. And just talking to some of the adult providers who deal with concussion in adults, um, there's still some ideas out there as far as getting back into sport, but for teenagers, um, because of a developing brain, um, there still are a lot of differences compared to an adult brain. And so one of those is just there's increased brain size in relation to skull size. So even in a 16-year-old, you still haven't hit that full, um, you're close, but you haven't really hit that full brain size yet. And so that is just more room for that skull, to be, or the brain to be bounced around within that skull. Um, the other side of things too is that when it comes to executive functioning, and so executive functioning is that um, you know ability of your brain that is your filter. It's your ability of your brain to not blurt out something that you know is going to be hurtful to somebody else. It's that filter that makes you understand, yeah, I probably should do X instead of Y. That executive functioning has been shown to not fully develop um, until around 23 to 25 years of age. So when you're dealing with teenagers, that executive functioning not only does it get thrown off with concussion, but it can also take longer to recover um, from that sense too. Um, pathophysiology, so that just goes into the concussion mechanism. Getting back into this is a, an injury of the brain cell itself. So those nerve cells get stretched essentially. You have a whole bunch of certain electrolytes go flying out, a whole bunch of different electrolytes go flying in, and the upshot of all of it is that those nerve cells are not talking to each other very well. If you give enough time, those nerve cells will eventually start talking to each other, the brain heals itself up, um, and it will take care of that on its own. 
But, um, but that is where the problem comes in, is that there's nothing that you can do to you know, get those electrolytes back into equilibrium faster. You know, there's been a lot of research, and for a while there we were really big on like omega-3 supplements because there were some really good in, um, studies in rats showing it was beneficial, but it hasn't really translated well to human studies. Um, so when it comes to um, the pathophysiology of the concussion itself, um, we do have some treatment modalities, but we're still very much on a cutting edge side of figuring out what is best. Um, concussion still remains a clinical diagnosis. Um, the uh, clinical meaning, it's based on the symptoms, what that kid's feeling, and their physical exam signs. So again, there's nothing that I can do in terms of ordering a test or ordering an imaging study that says, yep, that kid has a concussion. It's really seeing that kid in my office, having them tell me their symptoms, having them tell me their mechanism of injury, and doing my physical exam, specifically looking at their vestibular system, um, but also vision, um, some other things too, that tell me, yeah, that, that, that kid's brain is injured. Um, again, no CT, no MRI. Symptoms can take 24 to 72 hours to develop. And impact testing does not diagnose concussion. We'll talk about impacts a little bit more, but, um, but the impact manufacturers even say, don't use this to diagnose concussion. So you can't have a kid hit their head give them an impact test that afternoon, they'll they pass their impact test, all right, you're good to go, you're fully cleared. That's not how it works, that's not how it's meant to work. Impact testing is really a tool to guide return to play decisions. So symptoms of concussion, I think you guys are you know, pretty well versed in a lot of this stuff now. Um, the, uh, the one that I find too is, is with teenagers, you can get this um, uh, emotional ability. So they are, you know, your kid who's usually the super laid back kid all of a sudden is you know, getting in arguments with their teacher. Um, this kid who, you know, usually is a super mellow kid is all of a sudden just, you know, really quick to tears. Um, you know, certainly a lot of these things in teenagers can be a super normal thing, and that's a lot of times where I rely on parents to tell me, is this your normal teenage grumpiness irritability, or is this your kid really not acting like your kid? Um, sleeping more, sleeping less. Um, uh, honestly, I find sleeping less to be uh, more common. Um, cognitive impairment, they just are, they're just a lot slower than how they usually are. Um, problems with concentration, lighter noise sensitivity. Um, so, that whole question, kid hits their head, does my child have a concussion? And when in doubt, sit them in out, and no same day return to play. And that's really starting to become just a standard when it comes to um, kids' athletics, no same day return to play if there's any concern for a concussion because of concerns of second impact syndrome, because we don't want to have kids like Jake Snakenberg happening you know, again. So um, second impact syndrome still is on, um, happening on a regular basis. It's a, it is a rare condition, but it's usually about once or twice a year in the US that you have a kid who dies of second impact syndrome. Um, Sideline tools, the SCAT-3. Um, King Debit is starting to be used a whole lot more. Um, and you know a lot of the physical therapists are starting, yep, that's the I one where they track all the numbers. Um, and you know, again, none of these are perfect, perfect tools, but they really help to say, all right, you know, there's a concern here. We should really um, be pulling this kid. Um, and I say, this was, this was the mobile apps that, I, that I found um, last year. I haven't done a big review of anything's changing from this year. But the, um, the PAR Concussion Recognition Response app, I think is a pretty good one. Um, but the, uh, you know, the SCAT-3 goes into just a lot of like standard um, questions, you know, Who's your math teacher? What day is it today? What run are you on? Stuff like that. Um, and then the King Devic is the numbers where they track the numbers and follow their visual acuity because we find that when it comes to vision and tracking, that those are some of the um, earliest abnormalities we see um, be thrown off in kids with concussion. And one of the last things to finally recover are those, those vision tracks. Um, initial assessment. So again, you know that kid takes a really nasty hit, falls hard. Um, don't be really caught up on pupil size. Um, certainly still check it, but when it comes to pupil size, when it, the whole idea behind that is basically you're looking to see if there's a brain bleed going on. Um, and 5% of the population has something called, has something called anisoporia, which is two pupils are naturally of different size. And it can be actually a fairly significant difference. And that's totally normal. Um, but it will be very, very obvious if the pupil size is different and it's a big deal. Because if the pupil size is different and that kid isn't talking to you, that's a problem, time to call EMS, get that kid, you know, have them checked out. But, um, but if that kid is talking to you and is totally lucid and you notice their pupils are different sizes, I, mean, I don't get super worried about that. 
certainly over the next three to four hours, if that kid is, you know, now, you know, acting like a stroke victim and, you know, not making sense when they talk or anything like that, for sure you're going to be taken to the ER anyway. But um, but the pupil size is 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 not as big of a deal because it's going to be very very obvious that it's truly a problem. Um, always ask questions. Ask those kids. You know, what run are you on? What day is it? Who's your math teacher? Stuff that they should be able to answer pretty easily and pretty quickly. You know, who's your best friend? Who, you know, any of that stuff. Um, uh, don't make it super hard um, or super confusing. Any red flags? These are your straight go to the emergency room stuff. I will always accept one puke from a kid after they hit their head because that just kind of can go along with the whole concussion thing. But if you've got a kid who keeps vomiting, vomits twice, and then definitely if they vomit a third time, for sure, that they need to be seen in the ER because that can potentially be an issue with brain bleeding. Um, they have slurred speech. Again, that can be just a concussion issue, but if they're really kind of not making sense, especially if it's a, a garbled speech, if their words aren't making sense, that's a go to the ER kind of thing, can't feel one side of their body, worst headache of my life, more, like just increased agitation, more unusual behavior change that's really just not right um, you gotta go to the ER. And then if there's any, you know, as far as that, and I take these phone calls on a regular basis too with parents saying, um, concussion, oh, I smell concussion. Um, um, the, uh, when it comes to concussion, the, uh, if a parent is concerned, if they're saying, I'm really worried about my kid, I think I should take him to the ER, I'm always gonna say, yes, please do, it's totally fine. <coughs> Keeping in mind though, there's a big push in pediatrics now to not do CT scans on everybody. There's a lot of radiation that's involved with the CT scan. And there are some prospective studies that have done now, that are done very, very well, that shows that if you have a CT scan, it increases your risk in later life of, uh, by one in 10,000 of increasing your risk for cancer later in life. And uh, yeah, one in 10,000 is not huge, but certainly it's, it's a big enough deal, especially when you're dealing with kids, that we aren't CT scanning every kid anymore. Um, the, our emergency department feels getting really good at this, of just monitoring kids for a good four or five hours, making sure that you know, their headache is being controlled, they give them anti-nausea medicine so that they're not growing up, um, that's controlled, that they're talking lucidly, they may not necessarily do a cat scan, <coughs> and that's totally fine. So just making sure too that as a coach, you know, if a kid is gonna be going to the emergency room um, to be checked out for their concussion, that, you know, if they don't do a CT scan, it's, it's not the ER not doing their job. Um, again, uh, the ED versus the physician office, so the role of the ED in concussion, is there a brain bleed or a skull fracture present? That's their really main, main role. Is there, is there a brain bleed or skull fracture that is gonna need much more emergent care? That's about it. Um, they can give, um, you know, they, sure they can give narcotic pain meds that kind of, you know, makes things a little muddier in terms of determine, determining are your symptoms from concussion or are your symptoms just from medicines? Um, but certainly if their kid's headache is so bad they can't sleep, well then yeah, for sure, you know, give them a, a Norco, that's fine. But, um, they also can give Zofran, which they're doing a lot more, which is an anti-nausea medicine, which I think helps a lot in those first few days of concussion recovery. But again, it's in this kid 24 to 72 hours. By definition, nothing in that, um, there, there are no imaging studies that can show that that kid has a concussion. So really, in terms of going to the ED or not, it's really a more matter of you're really not a brain bleed. Do I need to see my, bring my update to see a doctor? And the short answer is yes. When it comes to concussions, yeah, you actually do, and that has to do with concussion legislation. Because of the, because of how bad things can go with second impact syndrome, because you can have kids die, because you can actually have permanent brain damage. Um, if a kid does have a concussion or is suspected of a concussion, then you need to see a physician or a nurse practitioner or PA. So um, treatment management, um, the school modifications of return to learn, this has become a bigger and bigger issue over the last year. So it's small studies, but they're actually starting to be building on each other. Um, that the sooner we get a kid back to school, the better their recovery from their concussion is. So the gone are the days of sit in a dark room with the lights off and sleep all day, and we'll get you back to school in a week or two when your headache is better. It's gone. So it's more a matter of, all right, I, I kind of will tell people, you know, if you want to give your kid a day off to just kind of, you know, relax and get some pain meds on board and that sort of stuff, fine. But within a couple days, I really want that kid back in school. Um, that is, like I said, it, it has been shown to improve recovery outcomes. Obviously, you don't want a kid to be thrown back into school and every time they look at a smart board, they have a horrible headache or every time that, you know, they have to watch a video in class with the lights off, they feel like they're going to throw up. 
Um, that's where the school modification form that um, we work with with the school nurses comes into play. So the, um, the school modifications is a big part of getting that kid back into school, but getting back to school is a big part of it. Um, no exertional activities. So um, at least in that first few days, um, the body's trying really hard to repair those brain cells. And so it's using, you know, glucose and ATP and all that stuff. It's really just focusing on healing up those brain cells. If you have a kid who, you know, is just so antsy from being inside and they want to go out for a run, well now all of that energy is being used to their muscles and um, to their lungs and all of that stuff. And that energy is not being used for their brain recovery. So typically what you end up finding is those kids, A, they don't feel good when they kind of, when they go out and try to do, um, you know, getting their heart rate up and in those exertional activities. But B, they're also slowing down their recovery. So we really don't want to be throwing them into a ton of exertional activities. And that's actually where I, I like using the physical therapists a lot because they can slowly get them back into things on a, on a very regimented basis. I still tell kids to avoid screens as much as you can. It's very a lot for the brain to process. Um, as far as screens go, the data and, and you know, um, science on that is still honestly a little sketchy, but I will tell you the kids who stay away from video games and movie theaters and TV shows and stay off texting on their phone, I can definitely say that they tend to recover a lot faster than those kids who are just always, always addicted to those screens. Um, vestibular physical therapy. So this is what comes into play too when you end up seeing that physician um, within a few days of the concussion. Not only just formally diagnosing the concussion, but getting vestibular physical therapy started. Um, the vestibular system, you know, that helps regulate your balance, that helps your body, it's what your brain does to um, uh, filter out non-essential information. So you're riding in a car, it's your vestibular system that knows not to pay attention to every single tree that's going past, that you can just let that go and focus on the road in front of you. Vestibular system is what you're using when you're in a really loud school, uh, uh, lunchroom at school, and you aren't trying to pay attention to every single conversation that's going on around you. So as far as vestibular therapy, there actually are certain exercises that can get that vestibular system back on track. And that's where um, the physical therapists come really in, into play. How many PTs in town have that training? You know, um, what I found is that every single physical therapist has done vestibular PT training as like a baseline. But some did it more for like adult stroke victim kind of stuff or some did it more for traumatic brain injury, you know, car accident stuff. Um, and then some people have done more concussion specific um, vestibular therapy. So, um, you know, it, it depends. You know, if I've got a kid who is, I think it's just a mild concussion, I don't think it's a big deal. I think any physical therapist can do basic phys vestibular physical therapy. Um, so, you know, it's one of those things where definitely talking with the therapist at each office if there's a preferred physical therapist and do you guys feel comfortable doing this and that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, certain ones that you, you know, I hate that question. Um, I think, you know, in general, like what, what, in general, I, yeah, I feel like sports med and kinetic energy have done the most in terms of that extra concussion um, training. I know Stephanie Loomis has done some extra stuff as well, but I haven't spoken with her specifically about what she does. She just got in contact with me saying, did this. Um, but certainly, I mean, I've sent kids with concussions over to Johnson & Johnson and it would be great. So, you know, I think it, some of it depends on um, that level of training if it's really needed or not. So, um, vision therapy. So this is another new thing that's come along in the past couple of years in town. Um, and the downside, so when you start talking about vision therapy, so again, you know, when you're dealing with the, those vision tracks that were affected within the brain, um, tracking issues, those kind of things, there are some vision exercises that can be done. Some of the physical therapists can do those for really easy stuff. But if you have a kid whose vision um, and tracking is really, really thrown off, and I typically don't send kids to vision therapy unless they come back and see me at three, four weeks out from injury, and they're still having a really tough time with vision stuff, and the physical exam when it comes to certain vision aspects on the physical exam are really thrown off. Um, we're also not vision therapy. Um, the, uh, the vision therapy in town currently is not covered by insurance, so it's usually out of pocket. It's a pretty expensive thing. But sometimes even just um, sending them to go see their optometrist and just have their, you know, when's the last time your kid got their vision checked? Oh, it's probably been three, four years. Maybe we should just go and see the eye doctor and just do an exam just to make sure everything, you know, that kid doesn't need glasses now, something like that. Um, regulating sleep. I've started to harp on this a lot more in the past year um, because they're starting to get more and more science um, showing that 
Um, regular sleep patterns have a huge role in um, getting a kid back to play sooner. And so when I talk about regular sleep patterns, um, when it, so ideally, where for a teenager, um, the sweet spot is about nine hours of sleep at night. I think in reality, if a kid is getting eight hours of sleep at night, I'm pretty excited about that. But um, when a kid is recovering from concussion, we don't want them sleeping in until 11 o'clock and then just going to their afternoon classes, or we don't want them you know, getting up and going to school for half a day and then coming home and taking naps. I'm okay with naps in the first couple days after injury, but after that, you really want to get on a set sleep schedule. So they're going to bed at the same time every night, they're getting up at the same time every morning, they're not taking naps, same on the weekdays versus the weekends. And I'll give them a little leeway, yeah, you can sleep in an extra hour on the weekend, but um, if you're really tired during the day and you want to take a nap, go out for just a nice grandma walk. Go nice and slow around the neighborhood, keep yourself awake, and then just try to go to bed a little bit on that earlier side. But, um, but it's those kids who take frequent naps and those kids who are sleeping in until noon or one on Saturdays, those are the kids who are gonna take longer in their concussion recovery. And then in some extreme cases, medications, um, any medication use for concussions is still completely um, off-label. So that meaning the uh, Food and Drug Administration is not approved any of these medicines for concussion. Um, that being said, um, I go on the basis of the big concussion clinic out of Pittsburgh who um, are the people who you know, made that impact test and so we'll use um, medicines sometimes to help with sleep regulation. If you really have a kid who can't sleep and needs something, we can help with that. Um, if you have a kid who uh, uh, you know, is, is a month out, we give there's some other medicines that we can try. Um, they're starting to use even, um, you know, sometimes concussions can actually really increase um, ADHD behaviors in a kid who's kind of starting to trend that way anyway. So sometimes we'll get kids on ADHD meds. But um, the mo for the most part, um, we don't really use a ton of medications for concussion recovery. That being said, so um, ibuprofen and Tylenol, because I get this question a lot too. So we always used to say, um, don't give ibuprofen in the first few days after hitting your head, because if you have a brain bleed, it's gonna thin out your blood, and it can make that brain bleed worse. And in reality, that is all theoretical. It's actually never, there's no case report, there's nothing that's shown that when it comes to concussion and kids being hit, that that has any relevance. I feel ibuprofen helps a lot more with headaches than Tylenol does, but your kid may be different if you want to use Tylenol that time. But, um, but you don't have to stay away from ibuprofen in those first few days anymore. Um, the other thing is, we don't want kids to be taking you know, ibuprofen every single day. I mean, I'll get kids who come in to see me um, three weeks out from a concussion, I've never seen them before, and they're taking ibuprofen three or four times a day still. And that actually, you can get what's called rebound headaches from ibuprofen and from Tylenol where actually taking the medicines on a super regular basis can make your headaches worse. So um, I usually tell people, you know, if, if you gotta take the ibuprofen, the Tylenol, absolutely take it. But if you can get away with just, you know, nice cool walk up on your forehead, you know, rubbing the temples, whatever, that's actually gonna probably serve you better in the long run. 90% um, of teenage athletes with concussion will completely resolve their symptoms within two to three weeks, even with no interventions, doing absolutely nothing. We're doing sham interventions, you know. Um, any of that stuff is still showing that, you know, for the most part, kids actually do a really good job of healing up their brains. If you just make that environment around them conducive to that healing. Return to play can take a week or more. Um, and that's more based on that Zurich statement from 2012. And they do say that in terms of the set return to play, there should be 24 hours between each step. Um, when I have a kid who had a mild concussion to begin with, they're not a huge risk factor. Um, you know, certainly sometimes I'll push that up, but at a minimum, you're still looking at three to four days um, to really get a kid up to speed, speed as far as return to play goes. So, uh, you know, I still sometimes get those families who think they're gonna get cleared in my office and then they're gonna go straight to um, competing and, and that's just not a safe way to do it. So, in my office, what I do as far as return to play goes, and this also follows their guidelines, um, so no symptoms. And typically, if I've got a kid who's only been concussed for a few weeks, um, typically I'll say like three days, I want three days of no symptoms. If I have a kid who's been, you know, two, three, four months out from concussion, then I want to see a kid a good week without having any symptoms. Um, and they're, you know, they're, I don't care about that headache for 10 minutes when they stood up really fast. You know, that doesn't really count. I mean, it's truly like, I was working on my homework, I had a bad headache. Okay, that's your brain telling you it's not really healed up yet. The physical exam has to be normal. Um, they have to be back to a normal school schedule, so they're not getting extra time for tests. They're not, you know, getting their notes printed out before them. They're not going to the nurse's office. Um, the only exception is um, they're still potentially not in, in PE. 
I want to see the impact test at baseline. Again, impact testing is only age 11 and up. Um, but I do want to make sure that that impact is back to the baseline, or at least very, very close to it. Even impact says these tests aren't perfect. And so if I've got a kid who's, you know, 0 0.01 second away from statistical significance on um, their vision, you know, their, or, or their reaction time, I'm not going to hold them back for that. But for the most part, you got to be pretty close. And then complete that return to play protocol. And so why is that return to play protocol so important? It's because of second impact syndrome. It's because we don't want kids to have massive brain swelling and die on the spot. Um, I see this happen more probably in the wintertime, um, where you've got a kid who's trying to be super careful with their concussion. They slip and they hit their head on a car door or something like that in the parking lot. Um, and all of a sudden you go from a kid who is 95% healed and getting really close to moving into a return to play protocol, and now they're not just at square one, they're at square negative one. So certainly if you have a kid who's not truly ready to go and they hit their head again, um, there's a potential for even worse symptoms that take a lot longer to recover. And then again, that whole point about executive functioning doesn't really fully develop until 23 to 25 years of age. So you are dealing with an immature brain when it comes to kids. Individualized treatment, individualized recovery. So this is also find a, a really big source of frustration with kids because they all talk to each other. And oh, I had my concussion and Dr. Fitzgerald cleared me in two weeks. And, and this other kid say, well, I've had my concussion and I still haven't been cleared after six weeks. And there's a, there's, what we're finding as far as um, areas of research is there's probably a big genetic factor involved. We know that kids have ADHD take longer to recover, a kid with a learning disorder, family history of migraine, those kids take longer to recover. Um, the, um, certainly if they've had multiple concussions, they're going to take longer to recover. Um, a note about impact testing, again, it guides management, and it's not to be used to diagnose concussions. I'm okay if we don't have a baseline, although I really love when we have a baseline, it just makes my job a lot, lot easier. Um, best results are 11 and up. They're still saying pediatric impacts on the horizon, but they've been saying that for about six, seven years now. Um, so again, role of the physician, confirm that diagnosis, refer to therapy, range for school modifications, and eventually you do need that physician clearance. Physical therapists can help get that, that ball rolling, um, help guide when to push the envelope. I find with concussion recovery, a lot of it is, all right, I'm feeling pretty good. Okay, let's, let's push things a little bit more. Let's, let's get a little bit more um, exertional activity and we'll see how we feel. Um, and the physical therapist can really help with that. Physical therapists also uh, help me with the return to play protocol. Um, so technically you're supposed to do um, light exertional activity and then harder exertional activity. Um, what a lot of the physical therapy offices are doing in town now is they'll start, um, you know, they'll push kids from an exertional standpoint and then do a whole bunch of vestibular testing and then make them take the impact. And we consider that stage three. And if they do all of that um, and they're still feeling great and not having any problems, they come see me. I clear them, I put them into non-contact, contact, and then full competition. And so and we're kind of trying to tweak a little bit as far as with the, um, the different disciplines within Winter Sports Club about ways that we can do some of that stuff too. Role of the parent, you know your child best. Um, you always get those athletes who really don't play how they feel, but I mean, you've watched them try to you know, drive and you obviously know their reaction time isn't there. Um, you've watched, you know, tried to see them try to do some vestibular activities where they're kind of moving around and things are moving by fast and you can tell that they're just a little off. So even though they can give you a whole bunch of lip service about they're feeling fine, I really, really rely on parents to tell me, my kid is my kid again. Um, again, monitoring for that depression. Um, I try to, you know, I'm not a huge fan of parents asking kids every single day, how are you feeling? Do you have a headache? How are you feeling? Do you feel okay today? How are you feeling? Because I feel like that ends up kind of um, being a little bit counterproductive. So again, it's a matter of making sure that athletes know that they, they need to come forward and say, I really don't feel well. I need some ibuprofen. I need help in figuring out how to do this. Um, and just really encouraging that environment of healing. You know, really kind of saying, all right, um, you know, okay, a year, uh, you have a teacher who is not helping you out with, you know, school modifications. Sometimes you need a parent to step in and really get the, that ball rolling. Although the teachers are in town, are, they're getting really good with that stuff. Um, as far as the coach goes, definitely still encourage that athlete when they're, um, when they're out. Text them, make sure they still feel a part of that team, make sure they still feel, understand that somebody's thinking about them. Um, how's your recovery? What are you doing now? What do you need from me? Anything I can do for you? Um, communicating with the physician and the PT and the parent, um, you know, what can I do? What can I do with this kid? You know, is there anything that I can help with getting this kid um, back into stuff a little bit better? And again, tailoring those workouts as able during that return to play process, all right? So, um, you know, doing, you know, brushies and, instead of just going straight to, you know, anything like that at all. And, and as far as coaches, again, I'm happy to talk with any coach about 
can this kid do this, but not this? You know, it's, it's a really easy question. It's an easy thing to do. Um, the role of the athlete, again, getting them to own that concussion and, and, and really focusing on what can I do, um, monitoring those symptoms, doing the therapies, and then really talking. I really try to have the athlete take control of talking with their teachers about those school modifications. Um, for further reading, that's your consensus statement, so hopefully we'll have a new one coming out within the next year. I love, love, love the CDC Heads Up program. It's great information for coaches, great information for parents. Um, and then there's also the re um, concussion management program, which is put out to Rocky Mountain Hospital for Children down in Denver. And um, the woman who is really influential with working with Jake Stanford's family is the woman who's behind that REAP program. And I think she does a really nice job with it. Um, so to sum up, communication is key. Really try to have your athlete own their injury, and really, but you know, obviously give them some guidance. And then again, a safe return to play. That's everybody's goal. So um, there's my daughter. There's my snowboard and my daughter skis. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so cool. questions? Yeah. You mentioned on the concussions that it, it takes longer for ADD, ADHD kids to recover from In general, concussion. yep, in general. Do we know why? We think again it has to do with genetic components. We know that ADHD in general tends to be a very genetic illness. And we think that there's just um, potentially certain proteins, certain communication within those nerve cells that plays a role. Um, so that's kind of another one of those areas where we're not sure why, but it's more of an observational, yes, these kids usually take longer to recover. So no. their, de their development is behind? Typically, yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, up to two years or three years behind the average kid. Absolutely. So would this be also in other injuries, or is it pretty much just the brain? You know, that's actually a really good question. And I think in when it comes to other injuries, your musculoskeletal injuries, what I've seen just you know, treating ADHD kids is, is it that really becomes kid dependent. Because I think some kids, if, um, you know, they may be totally scatterbrained with all kinds of stuff, but certain things they can super hyper focus on. And so if you can kind of get them to really, you know, again, own their injury, and that can be tougher with the ADHD kids, but, um, but really to kind of focus on X, Y, Z in terms of organization stuff about this is what we need to do. And that's where, you know, a lot of the ADHD kids um, studies have shown benefit